Hi, uh, I am Scott Mauser. Um, I actually am a teacher at Messiah. Uh, that's one of my occupations. I've been teaching now at Messiah, well, actually since uh, Pastor Bus uh, first was ill. Uh, I, I started teaching his religion classes. Uh, we had also started worldview classes. Uh, so I teach on the reliability of scripture and then on developing and maintaining a biblical worldview for the 7th and 8th graders. And I teach 5th and 6th religion. Uh, the other job that I have uh, during the week, full-time job, is with Alpha Omega Institute. It's an apologetics organization that primarily deals with the evolution creation uh, debate. We travel worldwide. Uh, we we do everything from teaching uh, in uh, churches and in seminaries and schools, uh, even being able to go to public schools. We lead a worldview trips, which I'm preparing for one to Chicago uh, here in the near future. Um, and then uh, so I've been at Messiah, I would say, oh, I can't even remember now. It's got to be around Oh my gosh, 12, 15 years. It's probably longer than that. I forget. Um, but uh, definitely, um, Messiah is our home in so many ways. So we are talking about uh, broken and grace, and <clears throat> I really probably uh, could go on for a long time with broken, um, but what I'd really like uh, to talk about is, is what I think some people know, especially a lot of my students know. Um, I've always been one of those that have wanted answers for what I believe, a faith that uh, just kind of uh, accepted things without fully understanding or uh, seemingly contradictions. Um, has never been easy for me. And early in my life, uh, I had a, a sister who was studying sociology. I had another sister that ended up going into chemical engineering. And so science and philosophy and sociology and things of those uh, along those lines were very important. So I started reading at a young age, um, and everything seemed to be pointing uh, away from God. Um, I would say when I was in middle school and reading a lot of the different books, uh, obviously getting a lot of the different ideas from science uh, that I was learning in public school and trying to assimilate that into my faith, and it wasn't working. I remember going to my elders. I remember going to uh, my pastor at the time uh, and trying to get answers for some of these. And, and many of them tried their best, but they were not aware of answers that solved some of the scientific problems or uh, some of the, the problems that I was dealing with. And so when you have that kind of a mindset, and, and at my age, I felt that if they couldn't answer my questions, here were those who were in authority, here are those that I thought would know the answer, they did not. And to a certain degree, I look back, and that was unfair. Uh, you know, um, obviously our pastors and, and our elders can't know everything. Um, and so, but that was kind of what I took away. It, it ended up leading me uh, in a lifestyle, trying to kind of find out who I was, the identity that I had, uh, for lack of a better label. I would say that I, I basically ended up in the materialist and atheistic camp. Uh, I did dabble in other areas, um, such as the Rosicrucians uh, and other kind of, if you want to call them magical or mystical uh, ideas. Uh, but as you can probably uh, imagine, uh, drugs became a large part of that. Um, initially, it started out from some of the books that I had read. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Aldous Huxley wrote a couple of books, Heaven and Hell and um, uh, Doors of Perception uh, on peyote trips. And so I initially got into drugs more from a search, a philosophical search, a, a desire to have something beyond the material that I was believing more and more was what was true uh, to reality. And so, uh, but eventually that ended up uh, leading me into a recreational use. Uh, and I think for a certain degree, it was always an escape. Um, it was used as an escape uh, to escape some of the pain. Um, I've always been someone, uh, even when I was young, 
who suffered from severe depression. Uh, throughout my life, uh, on again, off again, uh, I've been on different medicines. I've been diagnosed as, as different things. Um, I would say a lot of the diagnosis uh, came later after uh, a drug overdose uh, that I had had when I was uh, living in California. Um, but uh, with the depression, uh, with the escape, I ended up dropping out of school. Um, I was going to Colorado College, Colorado Springs, ended up dropping out of school. I had a friend that had a legal Indian herb uh, that um, when we were getting ready to take a test the next day, I had an allergic reaction or, or a seeming allergic reaction. And I was in Betcher Health Center in Colorado Springs for about a week hallucinating. And so usually when one of your students is hallucinating, uh, I knew that I was seeing things that weren't there, but uh, they asked for a psychological evaluation. <laughs> before I could return to school. School was never that difficult. I had good grades. Um, but I was at a point where I felt that the world uh, was aligned with a materialist, nihilist, or, or very uh, uh, empty uh, view of everything. Um, when I was in California, and uh, I had been... Uh, doing some drugs that I, I usually didn't do. I, I usually preferred hallucinogenics, uh, but this time I had, I had done some others and had gone down to Monterey. Um, and I loved the ocean. Uh, I loved the expanse of the ocean. It used to help me to think. And so we snuck down into a private beach uh, and just sat there. Well, in a little while, I started feeling that uh, Something was wrong. Uh, I was having trouble breathing. I was having pro problems with the tunnel vision. And so I thought, ah, I just need to get back to, to home and just kind of rest. I'd been up uh, for more than a day. And so when I did that, I ended up finally getting to Salinas. Uh, and when I got to Salinas, I knew that I was going to probably end up passing out. I parked. I went into a little mom and pop stand in Salinas and I just walked in the door. Uh, sat down at a table, and I remember talking to the woman that came over. I could tell that she uh, knew something was wrong. And I said, I'm sorry. I think I've overdosed. Uh, next thing I remember, I woke up in the hospital, um, and the doctor explaining to me uh, some of the complications uh, that I was very near to experiencing and that would have ended my life. Um, after that, I started having severe panic attacks. Uh, even though I was, I ended up in a uh, lockdown patient program, and so I was uh, for eight weeks, and I knew that unless something could change my perspective, something could show me that what I believed about reality was not true, that at the end of that eight weeks, I would take my life. Uh, this was kind of my last ditch attempt. Uh, and because I didn't want to go from the frying pan into the fire, uh, I was raised Missouri Synod Lutheran. And so a lot of that uh, was still there. It was still in the background. And so I wanted to make sure because uh, I truly wanted to live what was true to reality. I was in a lot of pain. I was a lot of brokenness. And so uh, I went through their psychiatrists. I think at the time I left uh, the lockdown program, I was on six different meds, everything from Haldol. Uh, to Prozac, uh, just trying to, to get me stabilized. And um, no one was really doing any help. Well, they gave me a last ditch effort and they said, will you talk to the priest? We have a priest here that, uh, um, you know, would, would you talk to him? And so I agreed to talk to him and he came in and it, it was fascinating because he started asking me questions and he started showing me things and talking to me about things uh, that no one else had had explained to me. Uh, simple answers, yet I had not received them. Evidences that I had not known of. And so uh, from that trek, God brought me to the lowest place. And I think sometimes that God has to, to break you. Um, he had to break me. Uh, I was too self-sufficient. I always relied on my mind. I relied on my ability to get myself out of a situation uh, by craftiness or whatever it may be. And so when all of a sudden I felt that I was losing my mind, that I would no longer. I remember a friend coming in and talking to me. Her name was Sally. She was a friend of my sister's and she gave me a hundred dollar bill. And she said, when you get out of here, 
you will take me out to dinner. We'll, we'll talk. And I said, Sally, I'm never getting out of here. I'm, I'm never going to have my mind. Uh, now, on the lighter side, she also tried to get one flew over the cuckoo's nest in as a video. And, of course, they wouldn't let that in. But she did get the Looney Tunes cards in. <laughs> so she brought me Looney Tunes cards. But besides that, I, I didn't think. Uh, I felt that I would be institutionalized. Um, but things did improve. Uh, it was a long trek, and it was definitely not an always upward trajectory. Uh, it was up and down, um, still not necessarily living the life uh, that I should be living, not technically a Christian, uh, but knowing that uh, at least what I believed in regards to atheism was not true. So over the trajectory uh, of the next couple of, of years, um, a lot of things happened, uh, doing investigations, trying to find further and clearer answers, um, to the point that both my wife and I, and this was before we were married, um, one day we just came together and we said, you know what, I believe again. God had brought us from the total point, and my wife has had her own uh, difficulties uh, in, her, in her walk, uh, but God brought us to a point, two very broken people. I remember at our wedding, uh, her father got up and said, this is either the greatest love story ever or the greatest train wreck ever. <laughs> um, because of our passions, because of our past. Um, and so God brought me from, uh, from pretty much the edge of suicide, believing that all was for naught. Um, that's also why uh, I hope that God's grace uh, was not in vain on me. Um, the passion that I have uh, for Bible study and for apologetics, the love that I have for teaching students at Messiah, um, that hopefully that I can give them answers when they're still willing to listen, give them answers to show that what the world is going to tell them is true about reality is not. And that truth about reality will cause them to go into despair because there is no hope in it. There's absolutely no hope, no matter how you contrive it or how you try to create hope within it. It's temporary. Uh, it's nothing that can sustain a person, especially going through difficult, difficult times. And so those moments when I had the hardest, uh, I would try to remember. I still suffer from depression today. Uh, I still, at times, take medication. Um, I totally screwed up my body. But... Um, but that is why I have, I have the passion. That's why I hopefully I leave all my students have my uh, phone number. I still get texts and emails from kids in college, uh, even some adults, uh, because this world will continue to attack. And the only hope that we have is in the grace of God, uh, to know that our lives are not our own, that we're not accountable, well, we're not um, saved by our, uh, good works, and we're not condemned by our bad works, because if that was the case, uh, it would be hopeless in Christianity for me as well. Um, but we have a God that, even while we were sinners, died for us. And so I rest on that hope. And when I talk to high school classes, because I, I am given the opportunity, at least for the last four or five years, of teaching in public high schools on occasions, and uh, the thing that I tell the students is I said, I don't feel my faith a lot of the times, but I know it's true. And I know who he is. And I believe, as, you know, as Paul said, that uh, the one who has accomplished, who has done it, is faithful. And in that sense, uh, the hope is, you know, uncrushable. Um, not always felt, like I said, it's not always a happiness I feel, but it's something that I know is true. And so by God's grace, he never let me go. Uh, one of my favorite verses is, uh, you know, coming from Matthew, where he says, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. I love in Peter where he says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So that is the grace we have. And it's as sure as gravity. It's as sure as the world around us that we can rest in that. So no matter how bad it gets now and uh, we've definitely had our up and down, uh, but I've never uh, doubted uh, that goodness of the God who saved me. So, so that's kind of bringing me from brokenness in a nutshell to, uh, uh, to the hope because of God's grace.
It's an interesting concept, uh, talking to Pastor about wrestle now. And uh, one of the things that first comes to mind is wrestling. Obviously, you need to be in close contact uh, with the person that you're wrestling with. I don't want to say opponent, uh, because as we look at Jacob uh, at Peniel, and he's wrestling with God, God is actually there to bless him. Um, and so when I think about wrestling, first, it's a close contact. And I think wrestling now is making sure that we are in that constant uh, back and forth with God. Um, you know, I always tell my students that they're going to wrestle with a lot of difficulties and problems. It's not bad to have questions. It's not bad to look for certain things uh, to, to verify, uh, maybe truths about reality. And with apologetics and wrestling, there are times when the world will throw at you everything it can whether it's attacking you as a person, attacking your faith. And wrestling means really, it's getting your hands dirty. It's being able to, okay, this is what is brought against me. What can I do? First, take it to the Lord in prayer. Second of all, allow the guidance of, of good Christian mentors and people and look for answers to those. God has given us a mind. He's given us reason. And he's given us relationships that we can use those resources uh, to be able to, to come out and to be blessed by God through those encounters. I remember one instance that I had. Um, I was This was early in my return to Christianity. And there was an issue. There was a contradiction uh, that I saw within Scripture. And to me, it, it was a really hard issue because if I was to believe that this was the Word of God, then this had to be resolved because it seemed to be a problem. And so I prayed and I, I wrestled with God in the sense of, Lord, help me to find the answer. I, I, I did my study. I could not find a resolution. And I finally, it, I remember it clearly. It reminds me of a, a time my mom had with me. But I was wrestling with this issue. But the resolution finally was resolved when I gave it to God. I remember distinctly, we were in, my wife and I were living in a condo at that time, and I, I basically said, God, I don't have an answer. I don't have a resolution. But Lord, you have shown me enough that I know you are true. Help me just to trust you and to allow this, uh, you know, to just fall within that. And ironically, the next day, uh, I had a friend who was doing some theological classes online, and he had invited me. Uh, his name was Bruce. And so I went to, and about 15 minutes into the talk that the gentleman was giving that night was the answer to the question that I had been looking to for weeks. And it was almost as if God was saying, yes, uh, almost in a, in a sense, I'm not saying I'm Job, but in a sense that God was saying, there are some things you need to just release to me, that I have given you enough. And, and I will I will bless you. I, I remember my mom one time. I had come home, uh, not in good shape, uh, and I told my mom I was leaving. Uh, this is when I had gone to California. Uh, my life had gone to Hell in a Handbasket, and then I'd come back to Colorado. Um, and my life was still having major difficulties. And she said, I always remember, I used to tell God exactly what he should do with you. I used to tell God exactly how he should solve your problems. But what I didn't do is I never said, God, whatever it takes. And she said that night, I got down in the bathroom as you had left the house. And I said, and she said, I just pray, God, I don't care what it takes, save my son. And it really hits me hard because uh, I think my mom's prayers in a lot of aspects, uh, my parents' prayers, and other others for me as well. Uh, but she said at that moment, she said a peace came over her, and she said she knew everything was going to be okay. And so wrestling with God does mean, at times, digging in, trying to figure out answers, trying to understand. But I think we also have to realize that God is, in many cases, beyond our understanding. And the trust and the things that he has given us so that we can trust him are sufficient. And there are times that the wrestling ends with a, uh, Lord, let your will be done. And, and so I think wrestling, uh, asking questions, 
and doing that as long as in the end uh, we give the final say uh, to God. This is, uh, I've had many people ask me, uh, I think my kids, we had a kid at Messiah, um, obviously we go to church at Messiah, uh, that is our home, um, but also Messiah, we had a kid there for I think 17 years in a row, and I cannot say enough of how much both the school and the church has blessed my life, has blessed my kids' lives. Um, and really just the opportunity. I don't think people sometimes realize uh, without being both a Messiah and being in a public school what a blessing it is. The opportunity and what the kids have that are given to them, both a first-rate uh, education. Second of all, a deepening of their faith uh, in the religion classes and worldview. And I do want to say uh, to the students that have persevered through my classes uh, that I know it's difficult at times, but I hope that the blessing of the understanding of your faith and the growth in your faith. Um, you guys have been a blessing to me. Uh, you guys have helped me in so many ways. Um, and so it has been one of the greatest relationships uh, in my life. And if I could do everything over again, uh, a lot of things I would change, uh, but being at Messiah, both at the church and at the school, there would never be a chance of changing that. Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Scott and his ability to teach at our school and his heart for the ministry, that he's been broken, but he knows that you're the one who made him okay, that sometimes you have to go down the wrong path, uh, so far before you're ready to see the light and to depend on you and to hold on to that hope please help him to always be inspired by your spirit to share this truth and this light this word with others continue to increase his wisdom and the wisdom of his students to understand logic and how to defend the faith but in a manner that is full of gentleness and respect not knowledge that just puffs them up but love that builds them up and uh, builds up those that they come in contact with. Thank you again for Messiah and allowing us both to be uh, humble servants there. In Jesus we pray. Amen.